Dude, it feels good to be back here with you, bud. It feels great. We actually just came in from the garage. Ryan has a net set up in his garage Mm -hmm. because we're leaving for Sea Island, Georgia for a golf event this weekend. And um, the sidewall has a few holes in it. Dude, I mean... I mean, you're you're hitting hosel rockets up Lee Jansen's ass. Yeah, but Shanks, like the drywaller actually has to get a call from me. Um, That's unbelievable. But, you know, that's the nature of the beast here, living in the Northeast. We don't get that luxury to golf all year round. The swing's a little rusty. It's rusty for sure. I mean, um, we both are pretty rusty. All right, uh, buddy. I mean, you just came out of, you know, of a simulator and shot 69. I did. I did. But the, we did 12-foot gimmies. Now, imagine oh. if you could do 12-foot gimmies oh. in reality. Yeah. Right? In, incredible. I mean, it, it would be it would make life so much easier. Yeah, it's just kind of the way of it. So here's something that's interesting. You know, this this whole Chase and Birdies podcast that we're doing, uh, God, we have such a good lineup, man. And I think really our guest today is probably one of the, the better ones we could have up front on the lineup. What do you think? You agree? I would 100% agree. He's a hard one to get, and we got him. And... um a lot of people might not know him. Uh, a lot of people might know him, but the stories that he tells uh, are, are fantastic. I mean, this guy has been a referee through Wayne Gretzky, through Mario Lemieux, through Sidney Crosby, through Alex Govechkin. The guy has seen it all. Yeah, 30 years. That's unbelievable. And the coolest thing about it is my man loves golf. You know, sometimes it's great to hear him tell his hockey stories which he's done already on on Spit and Chicklets, apparently. But now we're going to get to see a different side of this man. Not only tell some NHL stories and about his career, but his love and, and affection towards the game of golf and why he keeps chasing those birdies, you know? He is chasing those birdies. I don't know how many of those he's really making. Yeah, um, questionable. But- but we'll we'll get into it and see where he is with his handicap, where he, where he is with the golf game, and and uh, what he likes to do while playing golf. Yeah, you know we want to give uh, give a shout out here. Thanks to Carrie Fraser for jumping on the podcast here with us today. Uh, again, Carrie's been a former NHL referee thirty years, over nineteen hundred regular season games, uh, not even including Stanley Cup Finals. So I'm stoked to have Carrie here. Thanks, Carrie, and let's get this show rolling. As you all know by now, Chase and Birdies is proud to be partners with Holderness and Bourne. Check them out online at hbgolf.com. Holderness and Bourne makes fabulous pieces to help you look good on the course, even if your game is not up to par. Check out their new arrivals now for this golf season. Also, head on over to chaseandbirdies.com to get some custom Chase and Birdie gear from Holderness and Bourne. We'll continue to drop these pieces through every season. That's chaseandbirdies.com. And hold on to some born at hbgolf.com. We have a very, very special guest. Uh, he is a former senior referee in the National Hockey League. During his career, he called 1,904 regular season games, 12 Stanley Cup finals, and over 261 Stanley Cup playoff games. And he has the record for the most NHL regular season games ever refereed. And on top of that, he has the absolute best hair that you will ever see. Everybody, let's give a hand for Kerry Fraser. Kerry, thanks for joining us. Boo. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Fraser, you were used to that. Fraser sucks. No, <laughs> Fraser is a legend. The, those chants happen a lot here in Pittsburgh. Uh, yes, it has. and All around the league, uh, as a matter of fact. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been called so many different names, boys, that uh, I even fel- celebrate Mother's Day. that's that's a good one that is a good one so let's find out a little bit about you uh carrie and in the beginning of hockey and what got you into hockey and then into refereeing absolutely well a canadian boy from sarnia ontario 60 miles north of detroit home of the silver stick for the minor hockey uh, youth hockey players uh in the in the pittsburgh area and around the country Mm -hmm. and I, like any Canadian kid, uh, wanted to become a, a National Hockey League player. 
my dad was a minor professional player. He played in Europe. He played uh, in the International Hockey League, the IHL. And he was really a tough guy. He was also a boxer. He was a goon without oh. any question uh, when he played. He was a fighter. And uh, growing up, I was just always a little guy. Uh, my younger brother, Rick, who sadly just passed in December uh, through a battle uh, with oh. cancer, Thank you. Rick yeah. was really a terrific player. We played one year of junior hockey together. Uh, he was drafted by the Chicago Blackhawks and the Indianapolis Rangers of the World Hockey. Bigger than me, uh, but, um, it, you know, it's funny how our, our makeup, uh, it can be uh, obviously character, but the internal engine that drives each of us, and, and listeners, please think about this and think about your own upbringing and background. I was the little junkyard dog that had to play with the big guys. I was always little. I didn't like bullies. My dad taught me how to fight in our kitchen when I was about 12 years old. Wow. I was playing uh, AAA all, all-star hockey, travel hockey, right through until I went to, into playing junior. We won all Ontario championships. We had great players. Five guys off our teams went into the NHL and played. Uh, Wayne Merrick won four Stanley Cups. So he was my line mate wow. with, uh, come growing up. That's so, awesome. Um, Dad would, you know, he I, and I was a lefty, and I had really fast hands. I was very slight, weighed, you know, mm-hmm. a, a pail of water's worth. And uh, <laughs> so in the kitchen, he, he would say, okay, put your hands up. I'm going to teach you how to fight. And whack, he'd, he'd hit me with a shot, open his hand, <laughs> knock me down. I'd get back up. That's he'd child say, abuse nowadays. You, put your hands up. Yeah, exactly. But I'll tell you what, when I played AAA Midget for him for three years, we had big guys on that mm-hmm. team, like Bob Neely, first pick of the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. Bob was like six foot one, a couple hundred pounds as a, as a 16, 17 year old. <laughs> but I was the guy that dad tapped on the shoulder because I guess I could fight better scared than the big guys could match. Mm. And we were playing in a tournament. I have a quick story for you. Right. Uh, it was the Silver, Silver Blade uh, Tournament in uh-huh. Fort Huron, Michigan. And uh, we were in the final game playing a, a big team from uh, the States. And they were dirty. They had a defenseman on their team. He was sticking our guys. He was just nasty. And my dad was a very disciplined coach. He said, guys, don't take any penalties. Let's win the game, win the game. Five minutes left. We're up by five or so. Uh, game well in hand. My dad tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Kerry, go take care of that bully out there, uh, the defenseman. Honest to God, boys, I had to almost jump to, to reach him <laughs> and reach his chin. And I speed bagged him with both hands. I cut him over both eyes. He was a Ooh. mess. And as how big was this guy? He was and as big as he, oh, he was six footer. And, oh. and I'm like five, seven, five, and, uh, and I was 119 pounds. And uh, yeah. so anyway, we get, th- we get thrown out of the game, and I'm in the dressing room, and the guys come in. We won the, won the tournament. Everybody's happy. And I hear this arguing going on out in the hallway outside the dressing room door, and it's a lady, and I recognize my dad's voice. And all of a sudden, dad, coach, slips in the room, locks the door, came over to me, put, put his arm around me, said, hey, listen, first of all, I really want to congratulate you. I'm proud of you for teaching that, that dirty guy a lesson, the big guy. You really gave it to him. And he said, but – Second of all, while you took the kid, I don't think you can take his mother. No. She's out there waiting for you to come out of the dressing room. Come on. And sure enough, honest to God, he said, we got to get you out of here somehow because she's not leaving. Oh, and no. uh, he, uh, he said, uh, you see that stick bag there? I said, yeah. He said, <laughs> I want you to climb in it. No. I was dressed. He, he zipped up the stick bag, threw me over his shoulder in the stick bag as the other, my teammates were walking out. And sure enough, she was looking at the faces of all of my teammates. Hey, she's probably and still waiting there, Carrie. By in the stick <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope I hope her kid learned a lesson because again, bullies. You know, you, you think there's always somebody out there that's a little faster, a little tougher, and, mm-hmm. and you know, I took my lumps too. I was undrafted. I had a whole bunch of U.S. college scholarship offers. I didn't choose that route. And a friend that was coaching in the IHL that played with my dad, pro. Uh, by the name of Ted Garvin, ended up coaching the Detroit Red Wings for a bit. Ted said, listen, Kerry, I've seen you since you were a little kid. Uh, Like, you're a good little player. You play big. You play tough. But you're not going to make the NHL. And you probably get killed in, the the, like, the American League or the minor pro leagues. Why don't you get into officiating? And he handed me a brochure to a referee school that was taking place that summer, 1972, which was the year of the Canada-Russia series. 
And uh, the World Hockey started that year, so there was opportunities in officiating. And I went to this referee school. I paid $250 five-day school, and I was scouted by the NHL assistant director of officiating, Frank Udberry, in a 10-minute stint that I worked wow. on the Thursday night before uh, camp broke. And he met me when I came off the ice. He said, really like what I saw. Uh, I'd like to bring you to the NHL training camp for officials. It's going to happen on Sunday. I just need to see if there's room for you and check with referee and chief Scotty Morrison. And sure enough, I got home from, from that camp. I received a call the next morning, Saturday morning, from Mr. Udvary, and he said, we've got you all set. We need you to come to training camp tomorrow, Sunday. Uh, report at 6 o'clock, and you're going to be there 10 days, and this is what you need to bring. Well, oh. I was so excited. Well, rightfully so. I mean, you're, you're young, and, and you are you love the game of hockey. Now you're going to be a referee. I came out of nowhere. Like, I had no aspiration to be a ref. So I didn't quite get the time thing down. I was so excited. So I left Sarnia at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, thereabouts, so I could get there for 6 o'clock. Mm-hmm. I walked into the designated hotel uh, on an airport strip in Toronto, and uh, I come to the front desk, and the night clerk's on, and I said, uh, my name's Kerry Fraser. I'm here, uh, NHL officials training camp. The guy looked at me and said, you're a little early, aren't you? We didn't expect you guys till 6 p.m. <laughs> I was there at 6 a.m. So, so then what did you do the rest of the day? Well, they didn't have a room for me. I found a couch. I fell asleep on the couch, uh, kind of hibernating. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, that, that, was my first, uh, mis- uh, that was my first bad call, guys. Yeah. Hey. yeah. So now, now you're a referee, and now you're, you're working the hockey games. And w- do you remember your first NHL game that you've ever refereed? My first game in the NHL was the Colorado Rockies against the Minnesota North Stars. And it was in 1980. It was like a, a week into the, set of the schedule. And there was a new rule that year that if anybody uh, started a fight, typically, historically, mm-hmm. everybody on the ice dropped their gloves and they grabbed the dance partner and they hung on to each other. Sometimes it would result in secondary fights, but most of the time it was just to keep everybody out. And it was historic. Right. what everybody did. Well, that year, there was a new rule. Anybody dropping their gloves following a fight would be penalized with a misconduct penalty. Well, we had a fight, two of them, right off the bat, and I had guys sitting three deep in the penalty box. Everybody dropped their gloves. Yeah. Everybody got a misconduct. Well, the two coaches thought that I was just screwing up the game, that I, uh, this rookie, baby-faced, you know, blonde-headed kid, uh, didn't know what he was doing. Glenn Sonmore, who was the coach of the Minnesota North Stars, hated me from that point on forward. And uh, we were leaving, uh, the fans were upset. They were, you know, screaming and throwing things at us. Well, when we were leaving the McNichols Arena back Mm -hmm. then in in Colorado, there was an upper level where the fans had a chain link fence where they could stand and watch the bus leave and the players go out into the parking lot. Well, as we walked out, they started screaming and yelling (laughs) and throwing things through through the fence. And Glenn Sharpley who was playing for the Minnesota North Stars, Uh said to Jim Christensen, the linesman who worked with me in that first game, he said, hey, Chris, if you need any help, you know, we're here. We'll get, we got you guys covered. Jimmy Christensen looked at Glenn Sharpley, said, Sharp, I've seen you fight. I think we're better off on our own. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's a good one. It segues into something really important about using uh, humor. To mm-hmm. diffuse certain volatile situations, and we'll get to that down the road. But but first off, I know you've got something else to, to ask me, probably. You've refereed for a lot, a lot of games, all right, and you've seen the likes of Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin. There's not very many people who can say that they saw that much greatness in their career. So I guess my question to you is, uh, do you have any good stories about Wayne Gretzky? Do you have any run-ins with him? Or- oh, big time! And I, and I'll tell you. You know, listeners, let's go back to my earlier statement about your your personal makeup, Mm -hmm. the things that you've absorbed in your youth and and in the schoolyard and on the football field. uh, What makes you tick? What is your flashpoint? What is it that gives you either the desire to fight or flight? Well, with me, there was no flight. It was all fight. People Mm -hmm. that got in my face would get it back. I mm-hmm. was that little junkyard dog, little man syndrome, chip on my shoulder. Ryan. You think Ryan has a little of that in him? Yeah, yeah he, I mean, he has a little bit of that in him, Kerry. I mean, he's, I think you guys are the same height, five foot seven each, right? 
Yeah, he's got me back up one. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Bash is That's five five. Escape. That's, That's all right though. Up. Yeah, but you know what though, Kerry? <laughs> yeah, I got the fight though, man. I got the fight in me, so that's it. You know, it's the underdog. Let me share because I think you'd probably have done the same thing as I did in my first game with Wayne Gretzky yeah, tell me. Uh, as, as rookies. So, Philadelphia Flyers are playing. Bobby Clark, Broad Street Bullies. The games in Northlands Coliseum in Edmonton. Wayne was already like the demagogue in that building. He nobody could touch him. He was like he had Dave Semenko to protect him and and Marty McSorley and etc. Actually, no, Marty I think was in Pittsburgh at that time. So the very first shift, I dropped the puck. Within 10 seconds, Wayne got touched on his shin pad, and he did a jump in the air, took a dive, and he was turning his head to look to see if my arm was up before he hit the ice. Right. Well, little man syndrome, stubborn. The fans got on me, and, and we didn't have a diving penalty back then. The only thing that the refs would do is kind of make that diver pay he could play the rest of the game on his knees and we would not call penalties that were legit. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And the more, the more I didn't call, the more Wayne dove that night. And with a minute and a half left and the flyers up by one goal with all that future hall of fame talent on the Edmonton Oiler team, power play would be their best option. Well, Pelly Lindbergh caught the puck for the Philadelphia flyers, God rest Mm -hmm. his soul. And I blew the whistle behind the net in Gretzky's office where he always stood. He jumped in the air. He threw his hands out forward, his feet backwards, and he belly flopped right on the ice. No. Bobby Clark skated over to him with the no teeth in his front, Mm. and he said, get up, Gretzky, you blank baby. Well, I went over to Wayne. I said, Wayne, what are you doing? I said, there was nobody within 15 feet of you. He said, well, you wouldn't have called it anyway. You haven't called an effing thing all night. I said, you're right. I'm going to start right now. No. Boom, I hit him with a teeth. No. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Wayne said, thanks. It's about effing time you called something, and he stormed off the ice to the dressing room. Is that That's two minutes or five minutes? That was a two. Okay. But instead of getting a power play, now they're a man short, and Gretzky's the guy that would likely lead the power play, and he's right. gone to the dressing room. He's so pissed off at me, he can't even sit in the penalty box. That's unbelievable. So I went over to Glenn Sather the coach i said flash you got to put somebody in the in the box for wayne and he obviously maybe has some equipment issues anyway after every game guys and i wanted to be the best i could be aside from being you know little man syndrome i am big time type a perfectionist and every game i did right to my final game i would review post game as to was there something i should have or could have done better Well, it hit me like a hockey stick between the eyes. I compromised my own personal integrity. I compromised the rules that I was supposed to enforce. I compromised my employer who paid me and the game that I love. I was not being honest and fair. I was drawn into a personal battle with a player based on my deficiency, which I now Mm -hmm. recognize, and I needed to fix it. So the very next time I saw Wayne Gretzky, I went up to him before the opening faceoff. Right. I apologized for my conduct in the previous, and I said, Wayne, please do me a favor. If you're fouled, I've got the, the courage to make the call. Right. But please don't dive on me. I take it personally. We established an excellent relationship throughout our careers mm-hmm. together. He was really uh, an amazing player. But he was also a really kind individual. And on the flip side, I had a game in uh, the Los Angeles Kings, and and this pertains to Mario. Mm -hmm. Mario was lighting up the league. Uh, I forget the year, but uh, every media was talking about the the great Mario Lemieux, Super Mario, taking over from Wayne Gretzky as the king. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... The LA Kings were on an Eastern road swing. They were getting spanked every night. They were just every game afterwards. The media was asking Wayne if, if Mario had uh, passed them now and was the best player in the game. He had to answer those questions. I caught them in Calgary. It was my first game coming from home in the South New Jersey area. And my wife had uh, a friend, a lady that uh, was at the kids school. And she had a little guy who had a very rare blood disorder but he loved hockey. He was five years old. He had to get it, his blood checked and the needles hurt and they scared him as you can imagine. Right. And so they tried to, they tried to talk to him about being tough as a hockey player and 
And uh, she knew that I was going to be seeing Wayne Gretzky. And that was her little guy's favorite player. So with like last stoppage of play, Wayne out on the ice, getting beat again in this game in Calgary. He had beard stubble. He, his eyes were gone, sunken in the back of his head. Wicked trip for him. And I went up to him and I said, listen, Wayne, before we finish here on this last shift, I said, i got a little guy back home uh, named David. He's got a very rare blood disorder. You're his idol. He's a big-time hockey fan and player. And uh, would you just sign a piece of paper to David? And I know when I get home, it'll give him a big lick. He said, no problem. So I go into the – we finish the game. I'm sitting in my dressing room. I just untie my one skate. There's mm-hmm. a knock on the door. And it's the PR guy for the Los Angeles Kings, the road secretary. I go to the door. I open it up. And David Courtney is his name. Hands me Wayne Gretzky's stick signed to David. That's unbelievable. The first thing he did before he got undressed, before he had to face the media again to answer questions as to Mario being better than him, was sign that stick to the little boy. That speaks a lot about a man's character. Stand-up guy. That's the thing, too, a lot of people don't understand is these hockey guys, they're everyday people. They have a heart, and they care, and they'll do a lot of things to make people uh, feel better if if they're sick. And uh, that's the important thing uh, to remember here is that they're people, too. So moral of the story, if you see Wayne, you guys are on uh, good speaking terms, I assume, correct? Absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> now, in 1993, of course, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs fans still, some of them hate me for it, but uh, it was game six of the Western Conference Final. The Montreal Canadiens had already uh, won in the East, and they're waiting for a winner between the Leafs and the Kings for the Stanley Cup Final. All Canada was licking their chops because it would have been the old rivalry, original six. Toronto Maple Leafs, Montreal Canadiens. Toronto had not won the Cup since 1967 which I, as a young kid, was watching that final game. And Bobby Bond scored the winning goal on a broken ankle. Uh, he broke it the game before, but was not going to uh, not play. That speaks to the toughness of hockey players as well. In any event, uh, we're in overtime uh, in the fabulous forum in Los Angeles, and the Kings are on a power play. Uh, I had given Glenn Anderson a penalty for uh, boarding for trying to run Rob Blake, defenseman for the Kings, head through the boards. It was one I had to call. So they're on the power play, end zone faceoff, Gretzky against team captain Doug Gilmore, who was having an amazing playoff run. And off the draw, there was a shot. Puck rebounded off uh, Jamie uh uh, McCowan's shin pad, defenseman for the Leafs. It went back to where Doug Gilmore and Gretz were still standing from the uh, original faceoff, and I got blocked. I blinked. Ooh. I didn't see it, but there was a stick movement, and next thing I know, Doug Gilmore grabs his chin, and blood's dripping. I stopped play. I I, I needed help. I, I couldn't tell what actually happened. It happened like in a blink of an eye. So I went to Doug Gilmore. I said, Keller, what, what happened? He said, well, Wayne took a shot and his follow through hit me in the chin and cut me. I said, well, if that's the case, that's not a penalty. That's the one exemption we have in that, that high sticking rule, a, follow, a follow normal follow through with a shot. Exactly. So uh, he said, okay, but you know what? Something just didn't smell right. Typically, mm. Wayne would be over pleading his case. And he had uh, sort of slid off to the side wall and he had this funny look on his face. So I called and other players were protesting. I shooed them away and I called the two linesmen in. Ron Huck Finn was at the blue line on the side of the ice that I was on. I asked Huck, do you see anything? Now, Huck had balls the size of an elephant. If he saw something, no balls. matter what, he'd, he'd tell you. Oh, those were huge. And he said, Jerry, I can't help you. I was looking through their back. I, I couldn't see it. I don't know. Uh, Kevin Collins, who conducted the face-off, he was kind of him and an and said, well, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, if it happened, did Gilmore was bent over low, but, you know, low, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure. Well, there was no way that I could make a call on that. I had to eat it. If you're not sure, don't guess. And as we saw happen a couple of years ago in the uh, – Las Vegas Golden Knights uh, game seven with uh, yep, the, in the playoffs. Uh, yep. Yeah, with the Sharks, San Jose Sharks. You know, cost five them, minutes and change left. Cost they them a series. 
cost them the series and maybe a Stanley Cup. They were mm-hmm. they were rolling, and uh, so that was a pure guess by uh, the group of officials on that ice, and, and they paid the consequence for it. So, long story short, couldn't tell. Had to eat whatever happened. Sure enough, very next shift, Gretzky scores the winning goal in overtime. Of course he does. Now, Why wouldn't he? Toronto fans went wick. They they went over the top, and uh, they lost in Game Seven. Wayne had the best game he admitted of his career. They won five three. I think he got uh, three goals and two assists. Now, there's a little byplay here about hockey fans. Okay, hockey fans are very intense. There was a psychologist one time that did a study that said the average hockey fan goes clinically insane for one second in every hockey game. Well, I got home from in South New Jersey from uh, my West Coast game, and I called my dad at home in Sarnia, Ontario, and, and dad uh, taped every game I did in the playoffs. And so I still didn't know and hadn't seen a replay as to whether the call was right or wrong. And uh, so I called dad and I said, uh, did you watch the game last night? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, it was, it was a good game. He said, uh, had a little excitement here afterwards. He said, I fell asleep in my chair, you know, in, in front of the TV. And he said, I had my tidy whiteies on. And dad had a little bit of a drum then, but he still had the forearms like Popeye. He said, about 3.30 in the morning, he said, I heard this crash and bang out in my driveway. And I looked out and there was a car driving into the the back end of my little mini motorhome uh, trailer hitch. He bang, back up, bang. I said, what'd you do? He said, well, I slid the patio door open. I grabbed the ax at the back door for Mm. chopping wood, and I chased this car up the street, whacking away at it. He said, I got a few good licks in the back quarter panel of the car as he took off. Unbelievable. I went, oh, man, Dad. I said, that's uh, that's not normal here. I said, let me call NHL security and I'll get back to you. Sure enough, two days later, security got back to me. They said, yeah, we uh, we tracked the guy's car down at a body shop in Kitchener, Ontario, which was about a two-hour drive from my dad's home in Sarnia. The guy turned out to be a Leafs fan. They questioned him, and he said he was so upset after that missed call that uh, he went uh, to find Terry Fraser's uh, home and uh, do some damage. That's crazy. Uh, well, thank God, the my old man would have cut him to pieces. He well, was that well good thing he didn't get a hold of him, right, with the axe. Yeah. Kerry, before we transition a little bit over to the golf talk here, I want to stay on track here one more time, one more second, or one more minute. You know, we're talking about a little bit of a trend here with these, with these hockey players coming at you a little bit. And, um, yeah, you're talking about – Richard Lemieux, but uh, I believe there was an incident that took place in Pittsburgh with uh, another <laughs> Lemieux. Um, you know, you oh, want to touch yeah. briefly on that because that's a great YouTube video for you listeners out there. Uh, if you Google uh, Lemieux and Carrie Fraser, you'll see this video and it's absolutely epic. Uh, and I'll let you, I'll let you touch briefly on that, uh, Carrie. You know, it was unfortunate. Mario and I had a little bit of a difficult start once he was named captain very proud player and I still hadn't quite corrected my little man syndrome uh, disrespect was something that, that rather bothered me and Mario didn't like to be touched and uh, on a particular play this year uh, in question uh, he had such a horrible thing overcoming back issues and, and he had the uh, the non uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and I mean just amazing uh, what he overcame and and such an awesome awesome player but um, in this particular game towards the end of the season, when he hadn't played a whole bunch prior to the playoffs, he felt as though he was fouled. Uh, I just saw him being stripped of the puck. And he took a whack at the player, uh, again, not wanting to sort of be touched. And, mm. uh, you know, it was a time when he called the NHL a, uh, a garage league, which I think he meant garbage league. Uh, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, he, was, he was very upset with the way the game was being played and guys were being allowed to foul. And I have to agree with him. Uh, we needed to be much better. In any event, when Mario took this slashing penalty, which was obvious, so frustrated, he's in the penalty box, and I assess the penalty, and Mr. Lang, a great uh, legendary uh, commentator, oh, he's the best. Play man, uh, he is the best, he is. I love them. Uh, but, but he had this situation all wrong on YouTube, folks. Uh, I didn't incite Mario at all. I just simply assessed it calmly and moved away. 
And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw like what I thought was a stick fly over the boards. And I looked and there's a stick laying on the ice in front of the penalty box. So I said to the linesman, Jerry Pateman, I said, did Mario just throw a stick over the glass? He said, yeah. So I just simply cruised by the, uh, like a drive-by, right. the penalty box, and I hit my hips with the misconduct sign. So now he's got 10. And at that point, as you follow the YouTube from the back door, Mario took his glove off. He undid the latch to open the door to come out mm. after me. But then he put his glove back on. And I guess having such skilled hands, if he was going to hit me, I guess he, he put his glove he on wanted to, to protect, protect his hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which is totally contrary to what I would have done. I would have thrown the gloves or left them there, and I'm coming out with the fist. But in any event... Which, mind you, Mario's a big boy. So, and you're talking, oh, you got did. bulldog syndrome. I mean, you're going against the big boy right now. Yeah. So I just stood there. I squared up, and he's coming. And fortunately, Ronnie Francis and... Um, uh, who was the other great Stevens? player? Kevin Stevens. Stevens, yes, yep. I'm sorry. Kevin Stevens, yeah. Yeah. So so they, they you know, they got a hold of, of Mario and that was the end of it. Now they had to have a hearing and Brian Burke was the um uh the adjudicator, uh, vice president of the hockey ops at the time. And uh Berkey called me and said, Did you have a previous run in with Mario? Mm -hmm. Because he brought it up that you had it in for him. And I said, Oh Berkey, I said that was that was like a couple of so years ago. I said I regret what I said to him. It was after he came out from serving a penalty and and he kind of mocked me and at the face soft circle and I said, I really unloaded on him. I said some things that I never should have about him being a captain and his his players not respecting him and I mean it was it was wicked. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what got into me. Uh, mm -hmm. and I truly regret it. Truly regret it. He is an amazing athlete. He was a mammoth of an individual. Oh. He had a wingspan of like an albatross, but his hands for a big man were so soft. I mean, in, in a good way. That guy, when he wanted to overtake a hockey game, he could overtake a hockey game. He could score when he wanted, how he wanted, and it was truly incredible to watch. Let's talk a little bit about why we're here. I mean, we're here to talk about golf, and, yeah. and you obviously enjoy well, the game of golf, right? It is my passion, guys. The, the game of golf is just something that we can all enjoy mm -hmm. uh, to later years with mm -hmm. all of our injuries that we have. We have to work through them. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, there's nothing better for me. When I drive by a golf course, and my wife will tell you, I see the fairways, I see the greens. I just want to get out there and walk on them. I yeah. love walking and carrying my bag. On a golf right. course. Yeah, well, I mean, you're holding a 10.9 handicap. Is this still true? Uh, actually, I'm a little better now. Oh, <laughs> we go. I, I, right. uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I just uh, moved into single digits. All uh, right. I'm, uh, what are we I'm, looking I'm, at? I'm calling you from Aruba, as, as a matter of fact. I uh, I was uh, 78 the other day here in uh, at Tierra del Sol in Aruba, which is the old uh, Beautiful. championship course. They built for the Shell World Series of Golf with mm -hmm. uh, with Jack and Arnie yeah, yeah. and uh, Gary Player. It's beautiful here. We love it. Just a couple names there. Well, I mean, so what what do you think the strength of your game is? If if we're out on the course and and I needed to gamble on you, what are we looking at? Well, here's what's changed, and we all evaluate ourselves, right? Uh, like, sure, we, we keep tinkering sometimes, and maybe it's our putting needs a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Uh -huh. uh, I'm really an internalizer, I, and, and what I finally came to after much self-talk, positive self-talk, is that my hockey player aggression has to be tempered on the golf course. I need to relax my muscles, mm -hmm. my emotions. If I attack the ball, look out. Who knows where it's going? Yeah. Instead of swinging 110, I'm back to dial her down to 80 and work on my putting stroke, rocking the baby. And I'm, I'm just playing with so much confidence and relaxation. Obviously, lessons here and there have helped. We've got a guy in our private golf organization that's helped me incredibly. He played with Steve Stricker oh, wow. at the University of Illinois. His name is Kevin Hain from Ottawa. 
is internationally acclaimed as a, uh, a teaching pro. Actually, Brooke Henderson was his young protege who's now on the LPGA Tour. So El Hamo has really helped me out with a lot of mechanics. My body's broken, guys. I've got a partial thickness tear in my, my left rotator cuff from a hit from behind in 2009 in a game in L.A. I've got five knee surgeries on my left, oh my three gosh. on the right. My left knee has no ACL. I did a whole career without an ACL. So I really have to make sure that I'm, I'm as loose as I can. The more I walk, when we go to Europe, England, Ireland, Scotland, mm-hmm. when, when I, we play over there, and the caddies carry the bag and we all, we walk them all. As the week progresses, I just feel better. I play better. I get better. And is that an experience playing with caddies over there? Oh, oh my God. Well, we're, we're, we're supposed to they head over something. there this, uh, this July over to Northern Ireland. But at the same time, it's a game that you can play forever. Right, Kerry? I mean... I remember playing with my parents from five years old and up, and, and it's a mm-hmm. game that you can play in business, um, enjoy it, play with your buddies. I mean, it's really hard to do something in life where you can bring 10 to 11 friends on a trip with you across the ocean right. and, and enjoy it. Yeah, but think about this, Kerry. Like, this is the crossover that we're trying to, to hit with this show. These other professionals, you, you play with, you know, I, I see a picture with you and Mark Messier. I mean, these athletes love golf, period. And it's a great way to spend time to build and nurture the relationship. You go on a trip, bring the wives with you. They can all go to the spa, powwow. Maybe they golf, maybe they don't. But the reality is this game does not discriminate, right? I mean, would you attest to that? Absolutely, guys. You hit the nail on the head, and I'll, and I'll tell you what. This is the other thing, guys. In terms of golf, it's not a one-way street. It's not about take, take, take. You give right. back. And, and I like to give back more than I get. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So hosting for me at my club is just awesome. And I want to make sure that everybody, no matter how many guys, I, I hosted a bunch of Philadelphia Flyers last year uh, before they went into uh, quarantine and the bubble for the playoff at my club. Very nice. They had a blast. I mean, it was Kevin Hayes and, and a few of the boys. Yeah. And they just had a blast and fed and watered them afterwards. They were being careful because they were getting ready. Right. To, they got to be go careful and be uh, hydrated, you know, right? Or dehydrate, yeah, whatever right. you want to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's fun. I was fortunate enough to have a, a cold beverage with you uh, after Oakmont Country Club last, what was it, last summer we played oh. a quick 18 at Oakmont? Yeah. How about I, that I, walk? I'm glad you brought that. I got to tell you, historic, incredible, but the toughest with the, the wind that day, it was the toughest oh. golf course mm-hmm. that I, I have ever, ever played. I mean, I was on, uh, I was on the first hole in, in regulation and four putted like the, the ball ball rolled. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the ball kept going back and forth. I thought it was a pin. I thought it was ping pong. The lack of trees now at that place is, is unbelievable. It's just it really heightens the, uh, the the level of difficulty for sure. We are going to transition a little bit here, Carrie, into what we call the tap in segment, and it's presented by Forty Four Concierge. So I'll let my partner here, Jonathan, touch briefly on this. Forty Four Concierge is a premier concierge company for professional athletes, started by current NHL vet. Nate Thompson, 44, make sure that all the moving parts of an athlete's life are organized and handled. So you just worry about scoring the winning goal or draining that birdie putt. 44, make sure their athletes enjoy more and worry less. So go check them out at 44concierge.com. All right, Carrie, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say four sentences, words, whatever it may be. You let us know what comes to mind whenever we say these. these yeah, sentences. these are right. All right, your first one, you ready? Yep. Pine Valley. Absolutely experience. Life altering. Mm-hmm. Getting a birdie on any hole at Pine Valley is incredible. Mm-hmm. Staying out of the devil's asshole is <laughs> even more incredible. Which <laughs> that, I did. that is true. That <laughs> is true. People don't realize how deep the devil's asshole really is. I mean, yeah. you can't see anything oh, from down there. Let me tell you something, Kerry. Uh, I have not played Pine Valley. I've been I've been there once. I've been in route there another time and never made it to the course because my my man sitting here to my right, Jonathan. We we went for his birthday one year. It rained cats and dogs the whole time. 
They shut the course down. I go to make a phone call. They're oh. like, hey, 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 bud, hit the telephone booth in the lobby. I'm like, what? Yeah, go to the telephone booth, come out. Next thing you know, I'm sitting in a clubhouse, and they ask me if I want turtle soup. And then to, to sum it all up, the next day we thought about playing. No, course closed. So we made it out there, and we rolled back. The next time around that we were going to get a chance mm-hmm. to play Pine Valley, same thing, inclement weather. So I'm He's not been there three. yet. Yeah. He's there for three. I've been fortunate enough to play. You're, but... you're a bad, you're mm-hmm. a bad omen. Yeah, you're I a must bad be. Omen, man. I, let me tell you something. This is its own town. You think you're at Disneyland when you cross the little railroad track and you see the sheriff's department, you see the town council, and you go to the guard shack, and now you're confirmed to come onto the property. The very first time that Ryan Gaino, my son-in-law, and I were there, we had hosted. TV member uh, from Chicago and another guest at Trump National Philadelphia, which is just around the corner from uh, from TV. Uh, they invited us that after our round, they enjoyed themselves, and they invited us to have dinner over at Pine Valley. We fortunately had a jacket and tie in our locker. We went over and we had an amazing dinner and drinks, uh, you know, out by the fireplace and mm-hmm. just, just awesome. So now it's about midnight and we're ready to go. And there was a mist. It was starting to rain. And the one member said, and we've got dress shoes on, jacket and tie. Would you like to sort of walk a couple of holes? And it's dark. And, and we said, absolutely. And we walked the first three holes and came back around. And I can tell you guys, <laughs> I was waiting for bagger vans to come yeah. out of the mist. You could feel, I, I'm not kidding, you could feel the energy of this place yeah. and just an unbelievable experience to walk it in the dark with a misty rain and the history of that place. And then to get to play it, wow, wow. Yeah, it's truly it's truly special. The layout's incredible. All right, let's go to number two. Mario Lemieux. Nobody better with a reach and a vision of the ice. That's a long one word, but I have mm-hmm. to say mm-hmm. that as great as Wayne mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. and the magic that he performed, the things that he did, the vision that Mario had in his, and, and I did the all-star game in Pittsburgh in uh, 1990. Mario lit it up. He was the most valuable player of that game. I think he scored five goals, maybe, if my memory serves me correctly. He scored one that was like, he took the puck from one side, faked the goalie out, tucked it around him and fell down. Uh, I mean, he was on fire. He was electric. Yeah. But, but to, Unbelievable. To, to, be, to be close, to be like 10 feet from him and look to where he knew that he wanted that puck to go right. to, Maybe Kevin Stevens on the other side for a one-time tap in. Mm-hmm. You could. It was like threading a needle. He had that little space, and mm-hmm. I've seen him score from the goal line on a one-time shot too. I mean, my favorite player growing up, Kerry, was old Robbie Brown, and Robbie <laughs> scored forty-nine goals with the guy on his line. So <laughs> that tells you. Um, all right, toughest hockey game that you have ever had a referee. Chicago, uh, in the old stadium. And we had many uh, line brawls uh, in that game. Chris Chelios was involved in um, a lot of them. And back in the 80s, the division back then with Toronto, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, and Minnesota was called the Norris Division. The referees tagged Mm -hmm. it the Chuck Norris Division. No matter what teams played, they fought like you just knew you had to be ready to batten down the hatches and we always knew. And, and sure enough, they didn't disappoint us. Um, when you have more than one fight going and there's one referee and two linesmen, and then you have a line brawl and then you have the benches clear and they fight for 25 minutes, put yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. How do you restore order? Right. Uh, There's, it's impossible. You let, you you let them, there's three, there was three of us, two linesmen and a rep. Three. So you let them fight and, and then, we, we would separate and look for a situation 
where one guy was maybe getting his rear end kicked and in a potential injury situation. And then we would go to that one and try and calm them down. I would jump on their back if they hit the ice and I'd do the, the squeeze press and pull myself so nobody could throw a punch. And I'd talk to them and talk to them mm-hmm. and just say, it's over boys. Come on, we're done here. You know, but that game in Chicago, I can recall out of all of the ones they went forever. It seemed like forever. Oh, and it's exhausting too. I mean, not that I've ever fought, but it's exhausting for 20 well, to you know, 30 what's seconds. About it, you got to stay, you, you missed the last call because you're up writing reports right. all night. <laughs> right. All right. Last one, Carrie, and then we're going to let you hit the, hit the sand in, in Aruba. Dream foursome. Got to go with Tiger. Got to mm-hmm. go with JD. Mm-hmm. Got to go with, you know, my buddy, Mike Weir. Um, I love Mikey. We're, oh, yeah. we're, from, we're from the same hometown. And I saw him as a little guy when I was uh, working with the NHL uh, in our hometown. His mom dropped him and his brother off with a brown bag lunch uh, at the golf course. They would play in the morning. They'd come in, they'd eat their brown bag lunch, and they would go right back out and practice all afternoon and mm-hmm. pick him up that evening. Um, he's had some, some injuries, and uh, he's, he's fighting back. So mm-hmm. I, I'd like to re- reconnect. Uh, with him and you know what I think from a uh, a sports guy I'd like to throw in Tom Brady in that in that mix and uh, I think we I think we'd have a blast well seven Super Bowl I mean it's unbelievable how good that guy is but I will say on, on Mike Weir he just shot 59 I think out in in Hawaii in a senior tour uh, pro-am uh, I saw yeah. there was a photo of him shooting 59. So it's really yeah, he's really coming incredible. back. He's coming back. Yeah, he's uh, he, he's had some uh, personal issues uh, that are straightened out. He had his elbow yep. surgery, and I, I'm really happy for Mike. He's he's a good good human being. He wanted to be a hockey player before he wanted to be a golfer. Uh, I think he made the right choice. Yeah, he uh, definitely was grown. Uh, well, from from what I recall, knowing Mike Weir, he was. Uh, around hockey from an early age and, and you know, kind of just crossed over into golf. Well, the height for you guys he's is all little, very he, similar too. Yeah. Well, I said he's a little guy. Well, Carrie, appreciate the the time you've spent with us today on on episode 102 of Chasing Birdies. And for you listeners out there, uh, don't forget to go head on over to linksoul.com. Wonderful golf apparel. Now we have Bubba Watson on the team. And if you type in at your checkout, Chasing Birdies 25, You'll get twenty five percent off of your order. So head on over there, Link Soul. Check out uh, what they have. It's it's great stuff. Some good crossover swimming trunks for golf and and wonderful shirts. Um, Carrie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, we appreciate your time, and we can sense the authenticity in your in your voice, how you express your love. For I feel golf. Like, I feel like there's a few uh, untold stories there too. So we're gonna have to do this again. Well, there absolutely is, and uh, I look forward to teaming up with you guys. And, and uh, let's uh, not forget Nate Thompson and uh, yeah. uh, 44 concierge. Uh, I have uh, experienced some of their good stuff, mm-hmm. and I can assure you, uh, listeners, uh, that you want to you reach out. Uh, yeah. They do wonderful stuff, as does uh, my son-in-law, All Access GTE. Yeah. because uh, that's allaccessgte.com. If you're looking for some wonderful golf trips, bucket list trips, that's some of the things that I've enjoyed in my travels uh, internationally and uh, domestically. Well, thank you very much, Kerry. Kerry, thanks so much. See you, boys. We hope, we'll we be hope you have a... I look forward to uh, more birdies uh, with you guys. Yeah, keep chasing We're the birdies. Chasing them. That's right, Keep baby. chasing them, babe. <laughs> there you right. go. Talk to you soon. We'll see you, Kerry. Thanks, boys. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you to Kerry Fraser for coming on episode 102 of Chasing Birdies. What a guy. I mean, the guy has so many stories. Oh. He's refereed four of the top six greatest hockey players of all time, I'd say. That's pretty cool. I mean, and we didn't even get to talk to him a little bit about Crosby or Vetchkin, but uh, I'm sure he's got some good stories, you know, buried under that hair somewhere. If I learned anything from my conversation with KS, if we start winning member guest buddy, I'm putting you in the golf bag so nobody sees you and carrying you out. And, uh, I mean, nobody will see you. Yeah, put me in the side pocket, man. 
use me like a rain suit. Hey, thanks again, everybody, for listening to Chase and Birdies with me, Ryan, and uh, Jonathan. Uh, remember to follow the show's Instagram at Chasen underscore Birdies on Instagram. And uh, also special thanks to our production partners over at uh, Simpler Media. And stay tuned. We got episode 103, April 1st, with Tyler Reed, country artist, songwriter, you ever heard of, in case you didn't know, well, this guy on episode 103 wrote that song. And he has some awesome stories. His buddies in the country music scene, on the golf course. The guy gets it. He loves life. He chases birdies in life and in the studio. See you guys April 1st. Yep. Thanks, guys. Next time. Ciao. <laughs>